everyone here to the NLA. Please can we welcome Rachel Huff to the stage. Thank you very much, Catherine. Soon after leaving Bath University in the mid-80s and returning to the Northwest, I met Ian Simpson whilst working in practice. He'd also recently returned to the Northwest after working with Foster for two and a half years. I was hoping to earn enough money to go on a long holiday with university friends. We ended up working on the same project. We found we shared similar ideals and ambitions to achieve great things. We also shared similar frustrations. For example, we were constantly frustrated by the fact that no, ma no matter how great an output one achieved as an employee, you had absolutely no control whatsoever what somebody say right next to you was producing. We talked about the possibilities and opportunities of the competition process and working on competitions together. We didn't yet know about the problems associated with that process, particularly at that time. And we decided to set up a competition studio to test what could happen. As you can imagine, I didn't ever get to go on that intended holiday. By sharing the story of my career to date, I hope, in my own way, to inspire some young professionals to follow their dreams, to have belief in themselves, to be bold, to follow their instinct, and to be passionate about what, what they do. So, in Manchester, in 1987, almost 30 years ago, unbelievably, when I quite recently finished university, frighteningly enough, we set up our practice. As a result, my architectural career development is directly linked to the evolution of the practice. And in my mind, the two cannot be separated. Ian and I set out with a shared ambition and aspiration of creating great architecture with people who share that vision. From those initial years focused on competition entries, and small-scale projects combining design quality with absolutely minimal budgets, we built a body of work and a reputation as leading architects in that city. In addition, we established a base in Clarkwell, London, over 20 years ago, in the mid-90s. We currently have a practice of about 120 people, located in approximately equal numbers, in two offices, Manchester and of course London. We have a turnover of nearly £9 million and are ranked equal 51st largest practice in the UK in the recently announced AJ100, having slipped a little from our highest position of 28th in 2013. We have a fantastic range of projects on site, from residential-led development such as Blackfriars, Dollar Bay and the first phase of Battersea Power Station here in London to a new concert hall in Antwerp and commercial projects such as One Spinning Fields and to St. Peter's Square in Manchester. We've always developed by being project driven, not system or process driven. And by this I mean getting the gig is the most important thing and everything else follows. We've also always said, we're only as good as our last project. So every project has to be our absolute best. Looking back, each project does seem to have spawned the next. Sorry, what was I just saying there? In this way, we see our current projects as a springboard for the future. A future that currently feels very positive and exciting, despite Brexit. But it hasn't always been like this. You, re you may remember me saying we set up a competition studio. Well, we rented a small, cheap space in a rundown part of Manchester to keep costs down. And we went there every day after work. Outside of the day job, we spent every single moment working on competition and entries. It was exhausting, but hugely exhilarating and exciting. 
being tested by dreams, by briefs beyond our wildest dreams. I remember working on projects like the Big Blue in California and the new library for Lysandria, they, thinking they were all within our grasp. That might sound absolutely crazy, but we didn't ever question the validity of what we spent all our time doing. Everything and anything seemed achievable. In fact, we were shortlisted for a high-profile national competition very quickly. We attended the announcement ceremony and became second, as we now know the worst possible outcome. But it gave us the confidence that we could compete, and it was a catalyst. On the way home, we determined that next time we'd be first. And on that basis, we set up in practice. We had no work. No idea about how to start, yet alone run a practice. But we were young and naive, so we just did it. It was 1987. We wanted to work on great projects with interesting people and have control over what we, what we represented in architectural terms. We set up in partnership, 50-50. We agreed that the practice name should be personal something you could relate to, and it should derive from Ian's name. He had experience. My surname's always been a problem. <laughs> and at that time, I looked very young, which wasn't at all helpful, as you can imagine, in the context of trying to demonstrate experience or track record. We borrowed 500 pounds from my bank. We bought a load of second-hand drawing boards and chairs. We borrowed a typewriter. We did a few deals in order to secure some decent meter and furniture. And we worked all day and what seemed like all night, every day and night, including weekends. We had a few financial commitments outside of the office. No mortgages, no kids. And by this time, Ian had taken a full-time teaching position at Manchester University. This was enough to support the practice financially for a long time. It also meant we had a ready stream of helpers, enthusiastic helpers at that, as competition deadlines loomed. When we did deals for printing with nearby print shops, and my parents provided an ever-ready career service to wherever the latest competition submission loca location happened to be. We maintained contact with our peers in larger practices, and were receptive to collaborating with them on, on interesting and challenging competition bids that they were either unable to do or that they thought our effort would bring better results. Sadly, this meant limited recognition of the fact that the work was carried out by us. Nevertheless, it gave us an income. And in one case, important access to a client who we ultimately worked with to take the project to fruition. You might just be able to see that the client was ICI, quite a coup for a startup. In those very early days, we had no business systems in place. We invoiced when we felt appropriate. We didn't have accounts with suppliers. We paid cash. We collected the receipts in the Sainsbury bag and took everything to my bag for sorting. We spent our first cheque on a skiing holiday and associated ski suits. And were promptly told by our accountant, the first of our professional advisors, and one that clearly didn't want to stay the course, that would end up in Kerry Street. We actually came across Kerry Street quite recently, so we now know where it is. Thankfully, we didn't get to see its bankruptcy courts. Gradually, projects began to emerge. A friend suggested us for a new reception space for the company she worked for. A fellow tutor at the university passed on a new built house. An extraordinary act of faith on behalf of the commissioning couple. A new practice, no track record, just a limitless commitment to achieve the very best we possibly could. We moved to a more central location in Manchester. We bought our first telephone system, cheap because it was brown, and from Loot, a broadsheet precursor of eBay. We shared next door's fax machine. We were approached by a group of like-minded creatives to look at a derelict building that they'd recently bought in a badly run-down part of the city, and then were invited to buy into the building as the fifth partner. 
The thought of owning and shaping our own office environment appealed greatly. The new partnership achieved a large commercial loan, and we moved in during 1991. We enticed a landscape architect, a planner, and a graphic designer to share our space in order to minimize outgoings. And this was extremely helpful in the context of the triple whammy that followed and very nearly put us out of business. Firstly, the security guard for the building racked up £15,000 worth of chat line calls on our cheap phone system. <laughs> Secondly, we found out that the tenant who we'd assigned our previous lease to, who was actually a photographer friend of ours, had done a runner, leaving us responsible for the rental debt, past, present and future. Thirdly, on 16th of September 1992, or Black Wednesday as it became known, the interest rate on our commercial loan soared to 16%. I mention these events because they mark a real low point in our career, but one which gave us significant lessons to learn from. It was around this time that I gave my part three. It certainly made for an interesting interview. However, being pioneers in this forgotten area of the city also brought opportunity. We let space to local artists for exhibitions, and in this way we generated interest in the remodeling work that we carried out. We established an active hub within the area, and we set up an association of interested local site owners, people who aspired to what they seen as achieve. In tandem, we brought together a collaborative group of construction disciplines. And together, we developed a regeneration framework which gained local authority support and grant assistance. We brought forward environmental improvement work, actively changing the face of the area by creating value out of poor quality built form. It was about making things happen when actually very little was. It was the early 90s, another recession, but on this occasion we didn't have enough work to notice. Our first big break, or so we thought, came in late 1992, when we achieved a major win in the first Architecture Foundation International Competition, judged by Lord Foster, amongst others. We'd been shortlisted alongside 12 of the rising stars of the day and received a generous congratulatory note from one of them, Bob Allies. We invested the money in our first CAD system, Max using Vectorworks. But the project took many years to come to fruition, both the client and the site unbelievably changing over this period of time. As a result, it required a huge commitment from us in terms of finance, time, and energy. However, it was worth it in the end. Oh, that's gone through. Sorry. However, it was worth it in the end. We achieved our first significant new will project, an absolutely vital addition to our limited portfolio. It was, around the, oh, sorry. it was around this time that we set up our London office in Clerkenwell, where we've maintained our presence over the last 20 years, again choosing to invest in the property we occupy. Though as mentioned earlier, some people still possibly don't realise that we actually have a London base, let alone realise that our London office is approximately equal in size to Manchester. <coughs> In 1996, the IRA exploded its largest mainland bomb in Manchester city centre. It provided a catalyst for the city to reinvent itself. A new awakening for a city that already had ambition and aspiration for the future. We gathered together the team that won the anonymous international competition for the master plan of the reconstruction. And subsequently won another anonymous international competition for which Urbis, Manchester's Millennium Project, grew. This was now 10 years on from setting up in practice, and we were finally able to turn a profit and actually pay ourselves properly. 
In addition, two other new build projects, number one, Deansgate, and the Transport Interchange, developed from the master plan. It was and has been a fantastic time to be an architect in Manchester. We've worked hard to gain the trust and confidence of the city. And as a result, we found that it's a city where the individual can make a real and tangible difference. The early 2000s were also the time of a very fruitful relationship with one client in particular, the Beetham Organisation. We achieved Holloway Circus Tower in Birmingham and Beetham Hilton Tower in Manchester. Together with the planning approval for one Blackfriars here in London. It was a busy time. These projects led to many others, all with a focus on large, urban, mixed use residential led development. That is until mid 2008. We had 100 people in the office when, within one week of our summer day out to Kew Gardens, the financial crisis hit and the majority of our workload was on hold. We were decisive and took action quickly and harshly, making approximately 50% of the practice split between Manchester and London redundant. It was a very difficult time for us, and everybody else obviously. As architects, we're inherently optimistic, believing salvation is around the corner, but you really can't live in hope. That action stood us in good stead. It contributed massively to us weathering the storm. For the next five years, and actually surviving. Here we are now, in mid-2016. We've recovered our position following the Great Recession, and we will get through the nightmare of Brexit. We are, I understand, considered successful, but we've also been lucky. We've never had what people term bread and butter work. All our projects are special projects, and key projects like on Blackfriars and Battersea Power Station that disappeared in the recession have come back, having been refinanced or bought by others and tweaked to suit the new reality. And the critical thing is still getting the gig. We've come from nothing in 1987 to 120 people in two offices. Yet 29 years on, we still feel like we're just at the beginning. Somehow that feels like something only an architect could say. However, we have a new name, reflecting a new practice structure, having widened the ownership of the practice to an additional 11 new partners, rewarding long-standing commitment and contribution, and providing security and empowerment whilst ensuring succession. All vital issues to address in strengthening the next phase of the practice's evolution. We feel hugely privileged to be architects, and with that privilege comes responsibility. Responsibility to create inclusive buildings, spaces and places in which everyone associated with them is able to thrive. Responsibility also to help create a more diverse and inclusive profession, and by extension, construction industry. Having pursued architecture as a career and found it to be so rewarding, stimulating and varied, yet having been discouraged by others when at school from becoming an architect, I feel this acutely. Structural change requires long-term thinking, action and involvement, and the profession must continue to work hard to create a more diverse and inclusive culture by whatever means. I'm proud to be the key representative for our practice as a partner of the AR Women in Architecture campaign, which was established five years ago and has been hugely successful in raising awareness and changing attitudes. I'm also active in Wonder Women Manchester, what a great name, a five-year campaign leading up to 2018, the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, celebrating how far we've come in that 100 years and now asking how far we've yet to go. And in addition, the Social Mobility Forum, which aims to improve opportunities and, network, and ne networks of support for young, talented people from low-income backgrounds. <laughs> Women currently make up 50% of architecture students, yet this drops to 25% in terms of qualified architects. Why is this? 
quote Christine Murray, editor of the AR, we must inspire a generation to invest in the missing. And I would add, only stop when they have been found. The next year or so, we'll see some of our key projects moving towards completion. We love the physical side of architecture. The translation from drawn line to built form is intensely rewarding. These are exciting times. Practicing as an architect and working with other passionate professionals is exhilarating. And in terms of living the dream, it's been an incredible journey so far. So, 29 years on, we remain true to our ideals. And along the way, we like to think we reduce some decent buildings. And enjoyed ourselves, importantly. We always think the next project is going to be more interesting, challenging, and stimulating. At our age, we're not winding down, we're winding up. Some might call that naive, but we just have a passion for what we do. And I suppose that's the key, really. If you have a passion for what you do, and belief in yourself, together with ambition, then really, anything's possible. And to use a well-known quote, often attributed to Muhammad Ali, if, you dream, if your dreams don't scare you, they're just not big enough. Thank you.